Hello and welcome. Rocks are an endless source of fascination to me and nature always provides interesting things to mess around with. This is a small chunk of medium grade uranium and it could literally be picked up off the ground if you know where to look. This one came from a mine in Colorado and is perfectly legal to own. Others have extracted uranium metals and its salts from similar ore, but there's a lot more than uranium alone here. So in this video, I want to take a look at the decay chain of both uranium-238 and uranium-235. Between the two, there is no less than 24 isotopes from 9 elements, including one gas. For that, I'll use three methods of analysis, starting with the obvious gamma and X-ray spectroscopy. Immediately, we can see all the familiar peaks from Besma 214 and this instantly recognizable one here at 609 Kev. Because of its uh, short 20 minutes half-life, Besma 214 used to be known as radium C before isotopes were understood. So how come we see it in this uh, millions of year old wax? Like many other isotopes, bismuth is constantly being generated as uh, higher parents decayed into it. The grandfather of all of them, uranium-238, is slowly converting itself into lead. Every four and a half billion years, half of what is left of uranium is gone. And on its way to lead, it makes a quick stop at bismuth-214 and others. Since 20 minutes is uh, very small compared to four and a half billion years, there is never any large amount of bismuth-214 in natural uranium sample. If there's so little of it, how come we can detect anything? Well, you see, depending on its nature, each radioisotope has a certain probability to undergo radioactive decay at any time. This is the decay constant called lambda. A high lambda indicates a high activity and a low number, a weaker one. Bismuth 214 lambda is 5.86 times 10 to minus 4 seconds to minus 1. Oh, okay, well, how bad is that? Well, we can calculate the specific activity of a single gram of Bethmus-214 using Avogadro's number. First, how many atoms of Bethmus-214 in one gram? 2.814 times 10 to the power of 21. Since they all have the same probability of decay at any time, the specific activity can be calculated like this. And we get 1.6 times 10 to the power of 18 decay per gram or backward per gram, which is 44 million curies. That's a lot. Compare this with the specific activity of depleted uranium, 12,700 backwards per gram or 10 to the minus 7 curie per gram. So a very small amount can easily be detected. Okay, how much? Well, in this part of the spectrum, my uh, detector usually gets a few counts per minute. Considering the efficiency, I'd say I can detect about 15 to 20 backwards. Now, the activity is the number of decaying atoms every second, so multiply that by its probability, and we get A equal N times lambda, or N equal A divided by lambda. So we can detect roughly 34,129 active atoms. That's not a lot, and far exceed the detection limit of other instruments. More on that later. Back to the rock. What else uh, is there? In the uh, higher energy, there's a small peak at uh, 1,000 kV. This is protactinium-234 metastable. Now this is an important one because protactinium-234 metastable is a decay product of thorium-234, which is itself a decay product of uranium-238. It is useful to determine the level of enrichment when collecting spectrum of suspected nuclear smugglers' luggages. Picture a spy with an advanced sort of portable gamma spectrometer quietly walking near centrifuges in an Iranian facility and collecting a spectrum. We can then look at the ratio of the uranium-235 main peak at 185.7 keV and compare it with that protactinium-234 metastable at 1001 keV. This gives a good idea of the enrichment achieved without collecting a physical sample. Now on that subject, I can't understand why we care so much about Iran enriching uranium. Iran has working nuclear reactors and fuel processing plants. They could get more plutonium than they need in less than three months. Enriching uranium is expensive, inefficient, and obsolete since 1945. But they did sign an agreement to not pursue the plutonium route, but are we really trusting them? Sorry, I digress. Uh, Okay, let's look at the X-ray spectrum of uh, uranium ore. These two larger peaks are X-rays from lead and bismuth. Thorium-234 is also visible. There is some of the detector component here, like uh, cadmium. And again, a couple of lines from protactinium-234 metastable. The rest belong to uranium-235, with the occasional radium and lead-214 way over there. Alright, so let's recap. So far we have identified uranium, bismuth, protactinium, thorium and lead. Let me knock out Radon with uh, the Radex MR107 I used in the Radon video. 
I place my sample with the radex in this freezer bag to capture the radon sipping out of the mineral. All three isotopes of radon can be detected, the 222 from uranium-238, the 219 from uranium-235 and the 220 from thorium-232. Here is a radon 222 and 219 from my sample and using some monazite for its uh, thorium content, we can also get a measurable response from radon 220, 219 and 222. As much as I would love to measure astatine and francium, they are both very short-lived and always in vanishingly small amount. Just like the present, astatine and francium are like the line separating past and future, always here but forever elusive. The mass spectrometer is an obvious choice for analytical work like this one. However, the better decay presents a unique challenge. For example, protectinium-234 better decay into uranium-234 and its mass changes from 234.043308 to 234.040953 atomic mass unit or a difference of 0.0023 AMUs. This is about 500 times below the resolution of an average ICPMS, so resolving these two isotopes would be like trying to see this book from orbiting altitude. Not gonna happen. To avoid these many isobaric interference, I narrowed down my uh, list to these eight isotopes. I can also verify the natural abundance of uranium-235 at 0.673%. Protectinium-231 did make a discrete appearance with low RSDs, Good confidence factors on the thorium-230 and radium-226, no surprise there. Actinium and polonium are still a no-show, also not a surprise. The mass spectrometer struggled to lock on a good signal from a few trillion atoms or less, where the gamma spectrometer can easily make a reliable detection. Looking at these two instruments in that way is not really a fair comparison since the energy involves a several order of magnitude apart. Kind of like picking up the milliwatt cell phone signal from your neighbors and uh, picking up a kilowatt station in Antarctica. Obviously, to detect gamma radiation, there must be gamma radiation in the first place. And that's why we take a last look at the rock before crushing it and acid digestion. The solution is then filtered and evaporated dry. The insoluble are digested again in sodium hydroxide and neutralized with hydrochloric acid before being evaporated to dryness also. The two solutions are then combined for analysis and some polonium will still be missing since the chloride isn't very soluble and some protactinium too since uh, some of its behavior are still poorly understood. This solution can then be passed through an ion exchange column and its constituent can be physically separated. Each and every drop can then be collected, dried and counted on the gross alpha and beta counter. To please the algorithm and because sex videos get a lot of traffic no matter how dumb, I was uh, going to do this demonstration naked, but because 95% of you are younger men, I asked this lab assistant to demonstrate for me. Yes, science can also be sexy. This is the uh, Ludlum 2929 counter. The total gross alpha are shown here, and both beta and gamma radiations are displayed here. The count time can be selected for measurement consistency with this knob here. The sample is introduced in this sliding door and locked in place like so. Because of the wide variety of kit ions, I prepared the same eluents used for lanthanide separation, which is a solution of ammonium citrate and citric acid to maintain a pH of about 4. My sample solution was carefully introduced in the top of the kit ion resin like so. The stopcock is then slowly opened to collect one single drop at a time. Once collected, the liquid is dried on the torch and counted and recorded by hand. I collected a total of 589 drops, including the blank background, more on that in a minute. As uh, you can imagine, this took an absurd amount of time and I failed five times before getting any results. But determination paid off and here are the results. This is the raw data with uh, some fairly obvious peak here, here and here. To see them better, I subtracted the background. Now, we cannot expect to see thousands of counts from a solution, even a concentrated one. The only way to reduce the background enough is to consider the standard deviation. This is a numbers game, and the statistical deviation can help increase the signal to nose ratio by eliminating all the numbers statistically close to background. So I did that, and this is what I got for the total alpha. Based on the activity present, the mode of decay, the elution behavior and likely oxidation state, I believe this is the polonium-210, uranium-238 and 234 here, radium-226 and 223, and finally thorium-230 here. 
with maybe some Protactinium-231 down here, but this could be nothing. On the uh, Beta and Gamma side, this may be Lead-210, Bisma-210 and 214, and the Thorium-234. Of course, I cannot prove any of it, and this is just all guesses on my part, but it makes sense to me. Also, it would be difficult to explain why the background remained steady around 5 counts per minute for over 50 drops and suddenly jumped to 13, 22, 14 and back to background for another 60 or so drops. This uh, counter is older technology but it's robust, accurate and pretty reliable. I had uh, no issue using it almost 600 times. This carbon-14 source gives very little alpha, while this uh, two-year-old polonium should theoretically indicate 7.5 million counts per minute, and this counter has an efficiency of about 21.3%, which is typical. The careful observer will notice the power of ion exchange to separate otherwise difficult mixes of ion. One of my uh, favorite hero, Glenn Seaborg, used this method to go beyond uranium. I just did the same thing, going backward from uranium. So, this is probably not your first YouTube video and you know what to do, thumbs up if you like it, subscribe if you want, Patreon, bell, share. I hope to see you again on the next one and thank you for watching.